Hello everybody and welcome to the Tuesday edition of Video Clips and I have just a couple things I want to mention. Um, the first thing is that for some of you who have been waiting, the Cancer 101 course is starting to be populated. This is going to be a monstrous course with at least 10 lectures and um, lots of homework and that sort of thing. It's moving toward the idea of having some people perhaps operate some support groups for us so we want them to be really, really knowledgeable. Um, but anyway, if you're interested in learning more evidence-based information about cancer, this is a course you might want to take. Second thing, we're just a few weeks away from conference and very excited here. We just finished the menu and it's mouth-watering all the wonderful things we're going to have for meals. Chef Dell at his creative best. The hotel will be making meals that Dell designs this year. And um, the speakers, if you check out the speakers for our conference this year, you will see that these people are not going to be someplace else you can go listen to them any place in North America in the near future, nor let alone in the same conference, in the same hotel just come one place and hear them all I mean we do conferences like nobody else does based on informed medical decision making which of course does lead to diet and lifestyle change and then um, the last thing is we have been spending a lot of time here over the last year looking at pathways to professional designations and we have created one um, called certified health educator that basically involves a comprehensive training program that is designed to tell you what you need to know, to teach you what you need to know, to be confident and competent in practice. And um, the first people who've enrolled in this are very excited about it. I've had some conversations with people who say, this is what I've been looking for. So if you're sitting out there thinking, I'm in the health profession and I want to be re-engineered into doing something like what Pam does at Wellness Farm Health, or if you're not in the health professions, but you want to get certified as a health professional, um, this is something you might want to take a look at. So for anything, as always, email pampopper at msn.com. Happy to email you information, set up a time to talk, chat with you, and, um, and explore these ideas further. So my favorite thing to talk about is exercise. One of the reasons I love talking about it is I know that for some of you, it's your least favorite thing to listen to me talk about because then you sit there and think about I should be doing it, I should be doing it. It reminds you of the fact that you should be doing it. But I'm going to talk about it anyway today, even though you'd rather hear about something else besides you should be doing it. So the ability to choose delayed gratification, which means that you make a choice now that won't pay off until a future time, is important in achieving any goal ranging from weight loss to business success. Many people find delayed gratification difficult to choose, particularly when it comes to food, because eating something delicious like dark chocolate or really good cookies right now offers definite and immediate pleasure while not eating those things and thinking to the future when you're going to be lean and healthy and um, energetic and that sort of, it's uncertain and it's just not as much fun as the chocolate right now, let's face it, right? Therapy can help people learn to make better choices, but it costs money. It can be expensive, in fact, and it's typically only recommended to people who really have serious self-control issues. A new study shows that an inexpensive and universally available option is effective in helping people to learn to practice delayed gratification. You guessed it, exercise. Researchers at the University of Kansas told four sedentary and overweight adults that they would be participating in an exercise program in order to complete a 5k race. At the same time, the researchers would also gather data concerning the benefits of exercise, including psychological changes, although the four subjects were not told that at the time. The four subjects completed several questionnaires, including one that measured what's called delay discounting. The four then participated in a two-month walking and jogging program. They met three times a week with the researchers who provided encouragement and, and uh, coached them along. The questionnaires were repeated every single week. One month after the training ended, the subjects were tested a final time. Three out of four had developed significantly greater self-control as a result of the program and were able to maintain their improvement one month after the program ended. The fourth person who didn't see that level of improvement had missed several sessions. Well, a second study, including 12 women, showed almost identical results and further showed that there was a dose-dependent relationship. In other words, the more sessions, exercise sessions that the participants attended, the more they got to, the more they, they developed the delayed gratification uh, skill, which is to do something now for future gain. And that, um, that's just one more thing we can add to the very long list of benefits from exercise, that the more of it you do in a dose-dependent manner, the more likely you are to do more 
other types of health promoting activities where you have to make a decision to do something right now for future gain. The results of these two small studies are not so surprising to me. I mean, when you think about it, participating in exercise is in itself an opportunity to practice delay discounting. People who exercise are choosing to do it, and that's something that has benefits later, exercise. Uh, many times they're choosing to do it instead of sleeping in. They're choosing to do it instead of meeting their friends for drinks after work. So one of the ways that you know exercise benefits people is it is the practice of delay discounting. Now, from a cognitive standpoint, brain function standpoint, What's really going on here? Well, exercise um, helps to increase the production of something called brain-derived neurotropic factor, or BDNF. And BDNF assists in brain cell communication and cognition and has a positive effect on the areas of the brain which are involved in complex thinking and decision making and which govern impulse control. So getting sedentary people to start exercising is always challenging, but the benefits are worth the effort needed to get some people off the couch. And the studies show that within a fairly short period of time, participating in regular exercise can result in changes in the brain that lead to more exercise and other good habit changes as well. So like I said, the hardest thing we have to get people to do around here is exercise regularly, so you probably get tired of my telling you every so many video clips the reason why you should be doing it, but I'm going to keep telling you because sooner or later you'll listen to me and you'll start doing it. All right, on to the next topic. There seems to be no end to the list of functions which are dependent upon the bacterial colonies that live in our bodies, and recently the list has grown to include not just those related to physical function, but also many related to mental health and behavior. Much of the published research has been done on animals, but we're seeing an increasing number of studies that look at the effect on humans. Emrin Meyer, who's author of The Mind-Gut Connection, which I covered in an advanced study, fascinating book, by the way, and his colleagues gave probiotic yogurt or placebo to women twice a day for four weeks. MRI imaging showed that the women had different emotional responses and changed brain activity in areas that controlled processing of emotion and sensation. The relationship between gut microbes and mental and emotional health is bi-directional, meaning that not only do the gut microbes seem to influence the emotions and thoughts of people, but emotional states influence the makeup of the gut microbiome. Research conducted by Mayer and his group also showed that early life emotional trauma increases the risk of developing um, irritable bowel syndrome. A randomized controlled study showed that one month after starting probiotics, subjects showed a decrease in ruminative negative thoughts. Taking prebiotics and pseudocommensals, that may be a new term for you, but these are microbes that don't live in the GI tract but tend to pass through the body because they appear in water and in um, uh, soil, has been shown to increase or decrease rather anxiety. One fascinating study showed that researchers were able to determine which patients were depressed and which were not by looking at microbial samples from fecal swabs. And researchers have even found differences in the oral microbiomes of people who have schizophrenia versus people who don't. Well, there's no end to this type of information, and the medical literature is full of this type of stuff. I've started looking for it because we're offering a course right now called Why and How to Withdraw from Psychiatric Drugs, which one section of it deals with preparing the body for psychiatric drug withdrawal. In other words, all the restorative things you can possibly do to get ready to get off of these awful drugs. And there's just a very rich um, and growing body of research that, that uh, talks about the microbiomes of the body and their various influences on mental state. This information is helpful and it may provide some clues as to how we can help people with psychological disorders to feel better faster. But the thing that concerns me about all of this is that the reductionists amongst us are likely to start promoting probiotic pills as treatments for depression and anxiety. I mean, one of the shortcomings of all branches of medicine is looking for magic cure pills and nutrients and drugs to solve our problems instead of the hard work it takes to really get better. So I think that probiotics will turn out to be really good and effective adjuvants, but they're not a substitute for addressing the whole person, which includes looking at diet and exercise and, and the role of therapy. I mean, therapy, when it's done right by capable people, has a profound effect on other people's lives, and we shouldn't leave that out of the equation either. All right, well, that's all for today, and um, please, as usual, please pass this on to anybody who you think would enjoy watching it, and I'll be back to you on Thursday with more news.